I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Bobby Hobgood. He is the director of the Language Resource Center and the Department of Languages and Culture Studies at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. In his role, he supports the integration of technology by both faculty and students in the study of languages and world cultures. He also offers webinar series, book talks, and face-to-face -face workshops on a range of curriculum issues focused on pedagogy to engage learners. He's also taught undergraduate foreign language methods and currently teaches elementary French, advanced methods to, for foreign languages and advanced pedagogy for the TESL as a completely online course in the graduate school. Bobby's is a certified Quality Matters reviewer. He's also the 2016 recipient of the Honorary Lifetime Member Award for the Foreign Language Association of North Carolina and the 2017 recipient of the Educator, Educator of Excellence Award for the Southern Conference on Language Teaching, or SCULT. He currently serves as president-elect of the Southern Conference on Language Teaching as well. Dr. Hobgood, welcome. We are so happy to have you with us. Great. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you this afternoon uh, to talk to you about uh, an intersectionality that is very important for me. And uh, throughout my professional career, I found myself uh, in the crossroads uh, or the intersection of a number of different disciplines and domains. And so today, uh, the intersection where I find myself is looking at the online environment and how it intersects with the interpersonal mode uh, of uh, teaching. Uh, and so uh, this afternoon, uh, what I'd like to, uh, to share with you uh, is uh, my experience uh, as both an online educator since 1996 uh, and as a curriculum instruction specialist, uh, and then uh, someone who teaches a foreign language and speaks several languages. So uh, I want to first define and situate uh, interpersonal communication uh, in our context this afternoon. Uh, I want to talk to you about some design considerations uh, that impact materials selection. Um, we want to look at the actual material selection, uh, but through the lens of promoting meaningful interaction. And we had earlier today uh, some really good insight uh, from Jesse uh, about uh, those materials and, and the importance of authenticity. I, um, and so finally, uh, this afternoon, I want to talk to you about monitoring and assessing learners, uh, the process itself, the materials, uh, and the design. So as we continue this afternoon, um, because there's a lot to cover with this topic, I'm not going to be monitoring the chat box, but I've asked um, uh, folks uh, at uh, the National Foreign Language Resource Center if they would monitor that for me, uh, Sarah in particular, and then at the end, uh, I'll take some of the questions. So let's first uh, take a look at interpersonal communication and recognize that it's, it's kind of hard to talk about one of these modes of communication without talking about all three. So earlier today, we were fortunate to hear about the interpretive mode, uh, the ability to recognize, understand, analyze, and infer. Um, we are going to turn now to the interpersonal mode, but I also want to make sure that you are aware that as we talk about uh, authentic assessment uh, and the modes of communication, we're not just talking about interpersonal, we're also talking about all three of these. And quite frankly, it was hard for me to, uh, to talk about interpersonal without referencing the interpretive. Uh, in the same way that it's hard for us to talk about language or teach a language uh, without referencing the cultures that are represented uh, by that particular language. So this afternoon, though, we're going to take a look at the interpersonal. Uh, and so in that mode of communication, we're concerned with our students' abilities to express themselves uh, to one another, uh, either one-on-one -on -one or maybe in a group setting, to question what is being said, uh, to discuss uh, the information that's been shared by all parties, all of the discussants, uh, and to support and to validate one another. So, when we're engaged in interpersonal communication, or our students rather, uh, they are listening to one another, they are interpreting meaning and negotiating that meaning back and forth, 
and they arrive at an understanding with one or many topics throughout their uh, interaction. So how does this happen? And in particular, through the lens of an online course. So we're gonna be concerned with um, actually the five skills, listening, speaking, reading, writing, and culture. Uh, but with respect to uh, interpersonal communication, we think most often about how that happens through listening and speaking. So uh, synchronous or asynchronous, verbal and nonverbal, and then reading and writing. And one of the beauties of talking about this in the context of an online course is because our students are already there on the web, it's a no-brainer really for them to be able to access uh, a wealth of electronic resources. And as Jesse uh, mentioned to you this afternoon, uh, just the uh, huge um, multimodal uh, genre that we have uh, access to and that we can integrate into our courses. And so interpersonal communication, uh, to just sum it up, is about a two-way exchange. And what's important is that it is spontaneous and unpredictable. These two words I want you to hold on to, spontaneous and unpredictable. Students help out one another. There's some sort of follow-up and reaction to what the other discussant has said. There is the ability to maintain the conversation. We do that in a variety of ways, including eye contact and body language. We focus in on the message and we interrupt and ask for clarification when necessary. So, Let's look at some design considerations as we think about uh, interpersonal communication and interpersonal mode uh, in the online environment. So uh, first and foremost, um, we want to start with our learning objectives uh, and realize that everything is built from the learning objectives. Okay, And then um, we are cognizant of the various proficiency levels uh, that are present in our classrooms. Um, and so uh, this graphic you see here from Actful, uh, we won't go into details with this, but in the uh, handout that you will have access to following this webinar, uh, you'll get this information. But as you are thinking about designing that task, uh, you are cognizant of not only those learning objectives, but cognizant of the proficiency level or levels within your class. And you might reference a resource uh, like this that takes a look at those different levels and what students can do at the various levels. And what's really cool about this infographic is some guidance on what they can do to maybe jump up or move to the next level. Um, we wanna keep in mind as well as we're tasking or creating an interpersonal task and looking for materials online, um, the foci like uh, the use of language, so language functions, uh, and language uh, features, uh, language structure, uh, comprehensibility, uh, and then maybe minor focuses like uh, how well our students will use the language or uh, how much of the language uh, you're expecting students to deliver. So with respect to materials that we would use for an interpersonal task in the online environment, um, some considerations I think we need, to, we need to think about. So first, um, what happens when we take an interpersonal task that we may have done in a face-to-face -face setting and we put it online? In other words, are we taking advantage of the affordances of a learning management system or any other complement of web-based tools that our students might use as they're engaged in this spontaneous interaction. Secondly, um, is the resource that they're using, because quite frankly, I think many of the interpersonal activities we create are based on some sort of material or resource. And if you are like me, uh, very focused on your assessment plan, and maybe you're thinking about IPAs, uh, not the beverage, uh, but integrated performance assessments, as I mentioned earlier, the interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational, uh, then uh, you are focused, uh, in this case, on gathering materials for that interpretive, which then serve that interpersonal. 
Uh, but it's really important to think about where is that resource housed? One of the challenges that we all face is by using web-based resources and web-based tools, uh, we have uh, access to uh, authentic current resources. But at the same time, that challenge uh, comes when we depend on a particular resource that is there, maybe external to an online course, and then at the point at which students need it, it's not there. So an important consideration as you're designing interpersonal tasks for the online environment is how solid and stable and reliable is that resource if it's something you're linking out to. I always encourage educators with whom I work in the design of online courses to think about whether or not they can get a copy or some other version of that resource. Maybe it's an article, an image, an audio or video clip. They can get the rights to that and then make their own copy to put inside the, the course. Then you mitigate uh, that concern and worry about whether or not that resource is going to disappear at the point at which students need it. We also have to think about uh, this interpersonal um, communication as either happening synchronously uh, through a host of tools or asynchronously. Uh, again, uh, we're gonna explore some of those genres and some of those tools uh, a little bit later on, but uh, as we are thinking about the materials we need, we also need to think about if this is gonna happen in synchronous time, the interaction, then how will our learners access that resource? Should it be in a particular location? Um, and does that make a difference if the interaction is happening asynchronously? The other thing that um, I've struggled with at times is uh, finding out um, after the fact that my students really needed some information and needed some assistance and I was not there because they were doing a task uh, on their own outside of my presence. Uh, so uh, as we are putting together materials and designing these tasks, a question we have to ask ourselves is what kind of support can be available to our students when we are not there in the same time and same space? Uh, and then uh, this question about spontaneity, how do I ensure spontaneity? Uh, because one of the challenges if, again, you are not there with the students is you are not able to see whether or not they're looking at something that they've written in advance. Uh, this is a particular issue when we think about uh, online assessments. Uh, and so uh, here at uh, University of North Carolina at Charlotte, uh, we, we've done a lot of thinking and talking about, you know, how do we address uh, that particular issue? And I want to give you some concrete suggestions uh, in just a moment related to that. Uh, and then finally, as we're looking for uh, materials for this task, how will we evaluate what the students do if we are not present during a synchronous session? And how do we evaluate them if they are interacting with one another asynchronously. So what sort of process do we set up um, in terms of our ability to evaluate our students? I want to now focus on one of those issues that I signaled earlier, and that is the issue of spontaneity in the design of these interactions online. And I would offer to you some concrete uh, suggestions here. First, uh, and this goes back to the gradual release of responsibility model that Jesse referenced earlier, the idea that we often as teachers feel very good about ourselves when we construct a really nice activity, we use a numbered list, we are very clear, uh, we might give an example, but in the absence of modeling, in other words, providing a video of what this will look like or synchronously being able to talk through students and show them an, an example from a previous course, um, we might be surprised at what we get <laughs> in turn. So always, according to that gradual release of responsibility model, model the interchange, provide some sort of model in advance. Um, secondly, in the same way that we provide 
from the get-go the I can statements, the learning objectives for our students. We also want to remind them how they'll be evaluated. And in the latter part of our time together this afternoon, uh, we're going to look at some uh, strategies for doing that. Um, thirdly, um, in order to, to address the issue of, well, hmm, um, students might collaborate in advance uh, or uh, they might prepare something in advance. So one of the things you could do is uh, if uh, students are in the same location, let's say you're teaching online and your students are located at the same school somewhere else, um, or maybe if they're in different schools, um, one suggestion I have for you is to reveal who the partners are going to be maybe 10 minutes or so before they're supposed to interact with one another, if logistics permit. Um, in some cases, that is feasible. I know some of my colleagues who teach in virtual uh, settings are able to do that sort of thing, but that's one suggestion that might mitigate that issue. Um, another might be, um, if again possible, to require all students to record their interaction at once or to, to engage in that interaction and then let's say uh, they're interacting synchronously uh, using a tool like WebEx, uh, Illuminate, uh, or another uh, synchronous web conferencing platform, uh, then finding a way uh, for them to record and all of them to participate at once. So Again, uh, you're reducing the amount of time and opportunity for them in advance to, to interact with one another. So um, last week, uh, a good colleague of mine, Dr. Leslie Baldwin uh, from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, um, talked about the relationship and activity design of task versus text. And similar to that idea, uh, I want to share with you in thinking about designing and selecting materials for an online task, the distinction between an exercise and a task. And this also plays off of what you heard earlier today, whereby historically, traditionally, many folks focused first and foremost on the grammar. So for example, uh, a teacher might enter the classroom and say, okay, today class, uh, we're going to learn how to use the verb aller. Uh, we're gonna use it with different subjects. And uh, I want to uh, see your ability to, to use it correctly, which of course, uh, right away, our, our students are gonna check out versus um, the notion that uh, you heard from both Leslie and from Jesse this afternoon, we begin class by saying, today we're going to visit the Louvre Museum in Paris and we're going to talk about the various ways that we are going to the Louvre Museum and then we're going to talk about what we will do when we get there. So given that perspective and that context we're really focusing more on a task versus an exercise and so I want you to think about as you're selecting materials and designing these interpersonal tasks online that you focus first and foremost on achieving communication and meaningful use of the language. Uh, thinking about how you can engage students to employ different communication strategies and that you create a situation where the language is uh, not necessarily predictable, but there are some options for language use. And that you link the language that students will need. So what particular verbs, grammatical structures, et cetera, et cetera, to the context and not the other way around. So in other words, um, the task um, should, uh, should, should be uh, not dictate um, the vocabulary, excuse me, let me rephrase that. Um, the task uh, should dictate what kind of language and structures uh, we're gonna use. Um, I wanna say to you uh, this afternoon, one of the very simple, but I think very impactful ideas uh, that I keep in mind when I'm selecting materials and when I'm designing these interpersonal tasks is to, first of all, lead with culture and 
remember that then the language will follow. So lead with culture and then language will follow. Um, you may have seen these core practices uh, from ACTful that really kind of take a look at um, what do we want teachers to, to be able to do um, in, in terms of really effective language instruction and language instruction that, that fosters uh, authentic interchanges uh, that is communicative in nature. And there are two of those that we are very concerned with this afternoon. So first, uh, guiding learners through interpreting authentic resources, okay? Uh, and so we're already gonna select those for them, um, but our primary focus this afternoon uh, is designing those oral interpersonal communication tasks. So I bring these to your attention to make sure that first you, are, you have an awareness of these core practices, uh, and secondly, that um, you really think about these uh, in terms of what we're talking about this afternoon. Um, when we think about uh, interpersonal communication, um, Jesse referenced earlier Schrumming and Glisson, um, we think about communication that is spontaneous, occurs in a meaningful context, um, that features very often an information gap, meaning one interlocutor uh, has some information that the other does not and vice versa. And as a result, um, it requires listening and negotiation of meaning. And so as we are starting to um, construct this task and to think about what materials we need, um, given the core principles, given what I just uh, shared with you, uh, the nature of that communication, uh, this is a checklist that I would like to share with you that I've used. Uh, to identify and select some materials for the online. So first of all, focusing on what is the task and making sure that it's an authentic task. Because we're talking about the online environment, uh, taking into consideration how are students organized, meaning are we pairing them together? Are we putting them into small groups, uh, into a large group? Are they uh, doing a jigsaw activity, perhaps, where they are collaboratively sharing a Google document and interacting with one another? Um, and then once we've made uh, some of those important uh, foundational decisions, again, everything preceded by learning objectives and topics, then let's start thinking about what materials will my students need to complete uh, the task. Uh, and where will I find those materials? And so um, I'm going to give you some suggestions this afternoon, including uh, OERs and other content rich websites uh, and other genres. Um, and then um, as we start looking for those, what criteria would we use to select uh, materials uh, that would be a part of that interpersonal task? Um, what steps will make up the task? Um, how many times will students interact or is there just a single interaction? And if there are multiple interactions, how do you assess that and how do you uh, manage that from a classroom management perspective? Um, what do students need to complete uh, that particular task? And how will they access those materials? Do they get them in advance or are they served up in the moment? Another consideration is over what time? will those materials be used um, and where will students use those materials and then finally um, another suggestion as we're thinking about this task is how are you going to monitor what's happening during that task um, okay. what kind of technology will bring um, our learners together as we're thinking about uh, a, a synchronous task and choosing materials for that so um, there are so many different tools that um, you're already using and perhaps some that uh, I haven't referenced here, but everything from Flipgrid uh, to Skype to other uh, synchronous platforms like Zoom, um, tools that we might use asynchronously uh, like Twitter uh, or a shareable Google document uh, or perhaps a website. Um, or um, here at UNC Charlotte, we use Canvas as our learning management system. Uh, so you could have uh, an asynchronous discussion via text or uh, that asynchronous 
discussion could also happen via either video or audio. Um, I will tell you I have a preference for Flipgrid. Uh, so if you haven't seen Flipgrid yet, if you don't know it, uh, I would highly recommend you check that out. Um, so what are some of the tasks that we're uh, selecting materials for? Um, well, everything from um, small talk uh, conversations between uh, our students, maybe playing a game, um, ordering something uh, from a menu, from online, uh, maybe they're role playing and making an appointment, uh, perhaps completing an online track transaction or interviewing someone. Uh, maybe they're purchasing something or, or asking directions uh, or perhaps discussing an event or collaborating on a project. But these are just a few example tasks uh, that we might choose uh, to help students meet uh, learning objectives. Okay, so uh, now that we've, we've focused on the task and some considerations for designing uh, that task, um, let's kind of look at selecting our materials. And I will tell you um, first and foremost um, that we uh, want to select authentic resources uh, that are uh, as follows. First, authentic, accessible, appealing, and aligned. Let's take a closer look at these. So with respect to authentic, uh, as you heard earlier today from Jesse, resources that have been prepared by and for target language users, so not a resource that was prepared necessarily for a foreign language textbook. Uh, not that those resources are not useful, uh, but with respect to authenticity, um, for example, um, I bring into my class, someone had mentioned in the chat box earlier, Carrefour. We look at the Carrefour website to practice talking about numbers, uh, to uh, practice um, making orders, and, and so on. Um, and then um, it's uh, something that's created solely for the use of the target language speakers, uh, either for pleasure or for information. So. Um, choose a material that is, uh, is authentic. And as we heard earlier today from Jesse, there's so many different genres and places where we can access uh, authentic materials, everything from video clips, audio, articles. Um, we also studied uh, numbers in my elementary French class um, by looking at titles of articles and looking at the numbers that appear in a lot of those titles. Uh, so seeing the use of numbers in context. Um, we get a lot of great authentic content from uh, commercials, from images, charts, podcasts, songs, etc. I won't belabor these because we've talked about them already, um, but uh, my delight in being a language educator is the current and immediate access to authentic resources via the web. Secondly, we want to choose materials that are accessible, uh, meaning that they are appropriate to our students' age and proficiency levels. Uh, so again, uh, spending some time to really critically identify these resources. One of the dangers uh, if we, for example, uh, choose uh, a live broadcast or uh, any sort of uh, uh, streaming video with our students that, that's done on the fly is that you know, we, we can't control, we can't always preview what's going on there. So uh, the caution is to uh, keep in mind students' age and proficiency level if, that, if that's gonna be an issue. Um, also uh, choosing something that is of the right rigor and challenge, uh, something that provides enough comprehensible input uh, for our students. Uh, but doesn't go way too far. So a very terse text, uh, maybe an article from Le Monde uh, with no images, no headers, anything at all might be a little bit much for, uh, let's say, novice low students. Um, certainly something that is rich in visual supports, uh, helping students uh, to recognize cognates and known words, and that is hopefully in some way linked to uh, their prior knowledge. Um, choose a resource or a material that is appealing uh, to students so it's connected to, to real life. Uh, it's something that is happening in, in contemporary life. Um, knowing your students, uh, and again, you know, 
every time I do a presentation or do some research, uh, so much of what we do is tied to knowing our students. So knowing what is interesting to that particular group of students you're working with. Um, something that is attention grabbing, uh, perhaps it's humorous in some way, it's, it's a novel, uh, it takes a novel approach, uh, and maybe something that um, is, is text-based uh, that appeals to learners, uh, but the caveat there is be careful, uh, by virtue of their birthright, it doesn't guarantee they're all going to fawn over uh, technology. Uh, and then finally, um, choosing a material that is aligned uh, to our learning targets, uh, again from the get-go, um, provides opportunities to practice some interpretive skills. So something that students could do on their own, uh, but then kind of serves us as we move into that interpersonal mode. Um, in other words, is a springboard for uh, either interpersonal and or presentational task. Um, give some examples of the vocab, the language structures and culture in context, not in isolation, um, and uh, is a source of comprehensible input uh, for students. Uh, one resource uh, to help you identify some of these open educational resources, o OER, was referenced uh, in uh, a webinar last week um, by Billy, uh, I think Mikey or Menke uh, is his name, uh, and it's this uh, book that's available here, an OER training that gives you some great insight in how to access a variety of uh, online repositories like Merlot um, or other resources like this one from Humboldt State University, uh, where they've created what's known as a library guide. Uh, and someone has specifically pulled together for you a variety of resources you might find useful uh, in foreign language teaching. Uh, one of my favorite resources uh, is the Creative Commons search engine um, that allows us to search for images uh, that we can actually use uh, and uh, feel good about using uh, because they're licensed uh, for a variety of purposes in education. Uh, for instance, um, I did this search here on Paella, and uh, I want you to think about, uh, again, uh, as Jesse alluded to earlier today, the value of authentic resources like these images here, while clip art of paella might help you get the point across, I think there's something missing there uh, in that clip art version of paella versus one of these real images of a paella. So um, we've talked about uh, what uh, this interpersonal uh, communication mode is uh, about designing a task online. And uh, I want to, I've given you hopefully some ideas uh, for uh, selecting uh, those materials and some places where you can find those materials. Um, and let's just kind of look at one example here. Uh, again, an integrated performance assessment, which brings together uh, those three modes of communication, the interpretive, the interpersonal, and the presentational. Uh, and so in this case, uh, our theme um, is personal information. Uh, and I neglected to put the, the standard here, but the standard would be, uh, I can talk about uh, myself uh, to others, or I can um, present myself to others, okay? Okay, so, um, in this case, uh, we have uh, an IPA uh, that comes from Cécile Lenné. Um, and the scenario is the family's moving to Canada. And because you've studied a little French, you're going to help your parents with some of that paperwork. So I want you to look at this second statement here. Uh, and you'll notice that I've bolded the interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational modes. So in this uh, particular IPA, uh, you would read and show comprehension of the immigration forms or one of those forms. Uh, then you'll answer some basic questions from the immigration officer. So there's our interpersonal piece. And you might imagine that to be a role play. Uh, and finally, completing the form. So that's the, the presentational part there. Uh, so uh, it, what's so nice here is that uh, we can take students directly to a website like this one here, where they can actually see 
um, the, the form online, uh, and you might have to pre-teach some of the vocabulary, but, but what's really cool for us in French is that it's filled with so many cognates. So as I mentioned earlier, as part of my selection criteria, I'm looking for opportunities to draw on students' background knowledge uh, and to leverage cognates. So then that interpersonal piece comes along after they've understood the form, then they're going to help their parents by answering a few questions from the immigration officer. So uh, that young person, your student, is put in the role of uh, helping the parents out by talking to uh, this person. And this person in this case is most likely you or some other native speaker who's helping out with the course. Okay. So finally this afternoon, um, I want to share with you some ideas for how we might monitor uh, an interpersonal task that we've created uh, in the online environment. Um, again, drawing attention to the fact that um, when we assess a performance versus assessing proficiency, we're looking at two different things. So uh, in this case, uh, I'm really focused on assessing proficiency, i.e. tasks that aren't rehearsed, um, content that is appropriate for our students, um, the, uh, the, the, the task describes what the language uh, user can do uh, no matter where they are or when the language was required, um, and that the performance is sustained uh, across different levels, uh, meaning uh, to be at a particular level, they've got to demonstrate consistent patterns of all the criteria for a given level at, uh, at all of the time. Um, here is uh, one rubric that actually Cecile had created uh, to go along with uh, that particular uh, interpersonal task. So you see here, uh, we're looking at interpersonal speaking, uh, not the writing piece, but interpersonal speaking. Uh, and so she's actually spelled out here uh, what would be uh, the expected behaviors for, for different grades that she would offer. Um, Another type of rubric um, that I'm a big fan of is uh, the talk, rule, uh, talk score or talk rubric, um, which looks at these four criteria, the time, so in other words, uh, how much time is spent talking in the, the target language, um, making sure that the talk is relevant to the task, that uh, there's an acceptable level of accuracy, that's the A piece, uh, especially with regard to the objective of the lesson. Um, that students are listening to their partners and that they're on task and that they are kind and cooperative in the task, um, not killing the task, but, but working with their partner. And maybe you just have a, a little simple a checklist that, that students uh, can complete or you complete if there's a way for you to be witness to what's going on. Another rubric that I've used with great success, both in online and face-to-face, -face, is a single point rubric where uh, we just spell out what is good performance. Um, and then for us, it's easier to talk about, okay, based on good performance here, what are the strengths of this student and what are the um, opportunities for, for growth? Or in this case, what are my goals? Okay, and so either the teacher or the student in this case could complete the rubric. And then here's a similar rubric uh, for writing. And, and I'll share uh, the links to these resources with you, uh, both of them coming from the Ohio Department of Education. Uh, and then I, I just noticed I'm remiss for uh, not having the link here, uh, the credit for this one. But what I love about this particular rubric is that students uh, use that talk uh, assessment you saw earlier, but it's a self assessment. So um, you see there in Spanish, uh, mi compañera, mi compañero, okay, my partner, and then yo and I. And so there are two different ratings that are going on there. What I do, what I did, and what my partner does or what my partner did. So uh, just some final thoughts for you uh, today uh, as we think about selecting and adapting uh, resources for uh, interpersonal tasks online. Uh, begin, first of all, with the learning objective. Uh, making sure that um, your theme or your topic uh, includes those learning goals or objectives. Um, thinking about how you can lead with culture so that language will follow. Um, considering the associated interpreted and, and presentational components that might surround that interpersonal mode. 
Um, as we heard earlier also, backward plan the task and backward plan the lesson. Um, think about how during the activity and after the activity, students can self-monitor and self-assess and how you're going to evaluate them. Um, what evidences do you need to see exactly? Uh, remember to think more of a task and not an exercise. Um, and to choose materials that are authentic, accessible, appealing, and aligned. Uh, and to take advantage of open educational resources, uh, remembering uh, the uh, notion of curation, keeping that in mind that what is here today could be gone tomorrow. Um, to assess student performance with a rubric like the one I shared with you. Uh, and then finally, um, to consider thinking about engaging students in the assessment of the process itself. In other words, how do you get feedback on the degree to which this is working for your students and for you? And so I really appreciate your time and your participation and attendance this afternoon. Uh, merci mille fois. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. And I'm going to turn it back over to you, Sarah, for any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Hobgood. That was a fantastic presentation. And we had a lot of great chat as well as questions going in our chat box. And I want to start off our discussion by maybe talking a little bit about differences between modeling versus rehearsing. There was some back and forth in the chat about is modeling rehearsing? Is it similar? Is it different? Could you maybe tell us a little bit about the differences between modeling versus just rehearsing and maybe give us an example of modeling so we might be able to tell the difference a little bit with more clarity? Okay, yeah. So, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, we, we talk about modeling a lot and, and rehearsing. Um, so when I'm modeling something, I mean, I have in mind as the teacher what I want students to see from a particular model, okay? So there is some forethought there, okay? Um, and what I may have mentioned earlier, uh, and, and correct me, Sarah, if I'm going off in a different direction from the question, but I think students very often, if they know in advance exactly what they're being asked to do, then there's that tendency to rehearse and to memorize. Um, I'll give you an example. We, we have a challenge here with oral exams. And in our elementary Spanish program, there are so many students that uh, it takes away so much class time to conduct an oral exam. So instead, students come to My Language Resource Center and they record their oral exam. So they're given a prompt. The challenge though is that they know the prompt or one of a couple of prompts in advance. And what in my estimation ends up happening is that they are just memorizing, they've rehearsed something. And so it's, it's not very authentic that spontaneity and authenticity is lost there. Right, I definitely agree. And that's definitely one of the challenges where we want to avoid students memorizing their assessments and just kind of giving things out from memory. We kind of want that spontaneous interaction. Right. So another question that he had came through kind of piggybacking on that is, can you explain how modeling the exchange in advance would still assure spontaneity? So again, there's that concern of, are they going to just memorize things or is there a way that we might be able to just by modeling still have that assurance that there will be some spontaneity in the right. exchange? You know, this is a great question because it reminds me of the phenomena that happens whenever we show an example or model to our students. Um, I'm thinking back to version 1.0 of my life when I taught high school French. And I would show examples of previous student work. And as a novice teacher, I thought I was doing a good thing because I was giving them a standard for what constitutes good work. Unfortunately, what happened was that students all replicated almost perfectly the model that I shared with them. So what I would suggest doing is talking about students what a model means and how when you as the teacher present a model to them, you're not asking them to replicate what you're sharing. Instead, 
you're asking them to take that to spur some ideas. So what they can do that is very similar to that. And I think that's a skill that takes practice. Um, it's, one of those, um, it's one of those skills that I think we take for granted far too often because uh, as I, I can intuit from the question, the person is concerned about, well, if I model in advance, they're just gonna replicate exactly what I did, okay? So um, I think to a degree, we're gonna have to accept that they will replicate or uh, copy a little bit of what you did, um, but I think uh, through some scaffolding and coaching to help them understand what do you take away from this model, that's gonna happen over time. Definitely, and I like that you would advocate for having that conversation with the students of this is serving as just a model, this is not verbatim, what I'm looking to see from you. And I like that transparency, just as an educator, I like to be very transparent with my students okay. and honest about what I'm looking for. Really yeah, I good. Think so, sorry, if I could just interrupt. I think it goes back to, you know, so the whole metacognitive skills that sadly, I'm not sure we focus on enough, you know, helping students to think about their thinking, uh, which as, as language educators is extremely important. How do they think about using language and, and who they are as a language learner uh, and, a, and a user of the language. Definitely, all really good things to think about. We had another great question come through. If you are the type of online teacher where you're primarily teaching individual students, you're not doing a full class of instruction, oftentimes you might be the only person speaking the target language with the students. And there was a question that came through about if you have any recommendations for some online resources that students might be able to use to communicate with other people other than their one online instructor. Yeah, and so, you know, this is an issue for face-to-face -face classes. Um, it reminds me of bringing in guest speakers to class and then your students behave as if they have never heard the language at all, not a day of the language. It's because they're hearing it from a different voice, someone who is a different age, different personality, different character, different accent, etc. Uh, so in a case like this, uh, in order to kind of provide some additional exposure, there are a variety of, of services, some of them for a fee, some of them not for a fee. Um, I will say that my experience in this domain is you, you get what you pay for. Uh, and so some of the free services are kind of iffy. But I will tell you that here at UNC Charlotte, we've had tremendous success using the service Boomerang. Uh, and I don't know if uh, any of you have heard of Boomerang, uh, but it uh, has been used for the past uh, two semesters now, this semester and spring semester, uh, with a couple of our Spanish courses to uh, great success. The students love it. They have the opportunity to speak one-on-one -on -one with a native speaker. And the instructors love it because it not only brings in that outside voice and opportunity for spontaneous practice and conversation, but at the same time, that individual provides a report back to the teacher. So it's, it's not simply the student saying to their professor, oh yeah, we talked about this and that, and it was a great experience, but the professor actually gets some kind of feedback from uh, that, that person. So uh, that resource is called Boomerang. Boomerang. I'll definitely have to check that out. That's nice to be able to get some feedback rather than just taking the student's word for something that may or may not have been discussed. So that's a right. fantastic resource. Um, one resource that I, actually a few resources that I could recommend for situations like this. Again, you get what you pay for and things being free. Mm -hmm. um, there are two apps that I was recommended, um, Hello Talk and Hi Native. So these might be apps worth checking out for your students. I also want to recommend italki. Now they do offer lessons with speakers that you can pay for, but I actually ended up meeting one of my best friends through the website. Um, just we became conversation partners and we still talk to this day and she's become one of my best friends. So italki can also be very helpful and you might make some friends along the way. Right. So some other questions that we had come in, whenever students are moving up the ladder of proficiency, at what point do you feel that we might be able to put a rubric that would evaluate their work in the target language? 
So <laughs> this is another great question because I, when I hear that question, I am hearing that it's all or nothing. So my response to this is something that I do with my level one class. I'll give you an example. So from day one, we, we've had 16 classes now. I meet Tuesday, Thursday with my level one class. The beginning of every class, uh, at some point, I go over with them the learning objectives of the day. So I can this, I can that, I can so and so. So after a certain point in time, they recognize, okay, this is that slide, here it is. So one day they come in and I replace the words I can in the three objectives with je peux, I can in French. And it was just a natural sort of thing. Later on, I asked them, do you understand what this means? Uh, at the end of class, we typically will, will go to English for the last five minutes or so. And uh, they said, yeah, I can. And so I followed up, how do you know that? So I, I give you that example to say, don't think about all or nothing when it comes to creating and putting a rubric in front of them. What can you do step by step um, with the syllabus for the level one class before they even come to class the very first day? I put the headers in my syllabus in both French and English so that they can see the similarities. Fortunately, there's some cognates there, uh, but they become accustomed to the fact that, hey, this guy is slowly creeping in some target language in on us. Uh, so, so that's my response to that question. Don't think of it as all or nothing, but again, scaffolding how language is used and the role that language takes in that particular tool. Definitely, and that's definitely an important concept of it doesn't have to be all or nothing and we can slowly start to creep more and more of the target language in as we go. It's not necessarily as once you hit that intermediate threshold that you can go ahead and use the target language in all cases, which, you know, there might be a little bit of variation there. So thanks for the clarification on that. We had another question coming in um, regarding whether or not a specific tool is going to be considered as synchronous versus asynchronous. And for maybe some of the newer teachers in the crowd, might you be able to talk a little bit more about the differences between tools that are synchronous and asynchronous? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, first of all, let me say, if I talk very quickly this afternoon, it's probably because I had an extra cup of coffee today. <laughs> um, and uh, I should slow down a bit and kind of take stock of, of uh, you all, uh, or y'all as we say here uh, in North Carolina. We often talk about interactions in online courses as being either synchronous or asynchronous. So synchronous or the letter A in front or the letter A appended to, synchronous, asynchronous. Synchronous meaning happening in real time. So we, all of you who are participating right now at, what time are we? Uh, 5.53 Eastern Standard Time, we are involved in a synchronous interaction. So we're here together. Asynchronous means an interaction that occurs over time and you aren't in the same space, you aren't communicating at the same time. A common example of that is an email message, okay? So you're communicating with someone, but you may have sent that message two days ago and they opened that message, okay? So that's interaction that's happening asynchronously. Another example is a Google document. You all know that you can share a Google document or other types of shareable documents, and you and one or more uh, other folks can be typing and editing the document at the same time. So you can see the other person's cursor as yours is moving across the screen. Or you could do some work, and then maybe a couple of hours later, when you are away from the computer, someone else is doing work on the same document. So that is asynchronous. Synchronous occurring at the same time, asynchronous occurring at different times. 
Thank you for that clarification, much appreciated. Um, and that was really all the questions that I saw come through. One of our participants made a good point about how instructors need to be very careful and cautioning, especially younger students, whenever they go out to use um, some tools, for example, like some of those websites like Hello Talk, for example, um, just to make sure that their parents, for example, know what they're doing and uh, that they are very mindful of online safety. So that is just one other point that I did want to bring up uh, for the group, just to remind everybody that online safety is really important, especially for our students who are uh, considered not quite uh, full adults yet. So that's just one other point that I wanted to bring up. And I did have another question. Do you have advice on how to facilitate spontaneous conversations in an asynchronous classroom, maybe using a recorded conversation for Zoom, for example? I'm sorry, can, can you ask the question again? Sure, let me try to think of a better way. So for example, yeah. in a, if you're trying to facilitate spontaneous conversation, I think you might have meant in a synchronous classroom. So maybe for example, if you and I were in a Zoom room, this is what I do with my students and we're chatting away. Do you have some advice as to how we could facilitate some more spontaneous synchronous conversations? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, again, I, I sometimes think about this as narrating life or, or narrating um, what's happening. Um, we take for granted in face-to-face -face settings that students understand what's happening. We, we take for granted that they know how to do school. They know how to do their Spanish class. They know how to do their German class, their Italian, their Russian, Arabic, Hindi, Chinese, Urdu class. So in an online space, we have kind of taken away some of what they know about how to do their language course or how to do school. So in the same way that I mentioned earlier, I think it's important for us to talk with students about what they're doing and how this process unfolds. I think um, similarly, if we are facilitating a synchronous uh, conversation in a Zoom space, maybe up front we talk about, here's what you're going to experience today. And if you want to do these things during our time together, here's how you do this in this environment. In a face-to-face -face setting, you might do this. So for example, a common example is, how do you get the teacher's attention? So you, you raise your hand. Well, there's actually, uh, in, in most synchronous tools, a way to raise your hand or to signal, hey, I want to be recognized. I have something to say or a question to ask. So again, it's that kind of narrating how learning is going to take place. Those are all really important points, especially in the online world where you might have students that are a little apprehensive about taking an online class in general. It's a great way to break the ice with the students and also build that connection between the teacher and the students. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. And for our participants, if you have not taken the feedback survey yet, please go ahead and do so. That is linked in the chat. It's very helpful for us to get some feedback on all of our segments. So we appreciate your time. And we will be back next week at the same time, same day, and we will get together for our next sessions. Remember the TED Ed lessons, those will be posted on our NFLRC website. You should also receive an email link with those. And I'll be checking on those and leaving some comments and looking forward to getting feedback and hearing what everybody thinks about our discussion prompts. It's always one of my favorite part of just doing the facilitating work on this series. So again, Dr. Hobgood, thank you so much for coming out. And for all of our participants, have a fantastic week. We'll see you back here at the same time and same place. It'll be the same classroom. And I'm also going to put my email in the chat. So anybody who has questions or needs help with anything can always reach out to me. I'm more than happy to help and facilitate you through our process. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great week.